It is good to be with you tonight. I hope you're all doing well and having a good week so far. And I hope to see you on Sunday, if at all possible. I hope you can be with us either at 9 o'clock or at 1030 for one of the two uh, in-person services. So if you can join us at either 9 or 1030 this coming Sunday, please take the time and sign up right now if you can to attend. And that's using the Sign Up Genius account. If you don't have internet access or if you need any help with the sign up process, get in touch either with me or with Kenna. And thank you so much for your help with this. I know I say that a lot, but it really does help, especially in terms of having visitors. It's very uh, good for me to be able to say, sure, come on to this service or this service. Uh, we have plenty of room for you. And uh, I've enjoyed having the two services again, so we have a little more room to spread out. As a few more and more of you are able to join us as you've been vaccinated or uh, are, are getting over it or, or whatever the case is, just to hope to see you on Sunday, if at all possible. Uh, right now, I'm in my home office downstairs, and I've got the uh, beagle kind of sleeping at my feet over here. And if the UPS truck or uh, uh, anything comes by, she may she may go berserk on us, but I just want to give you a heads up ahead of time. Uh, hopefully she'll behave, but she's not known for behaving, and uh, we'll see how this goes uh, this, this morning as I'm recording this. Uh, getting close to noon here on Wednesday as I'm uh, getting, this, getting this down. Uh, anyway, in terms of good news, I am thankful to be back from Minnesota. Uh, the lectures this past Saturday were well attended, but this year the elders up there only allowed... Uh, the two sponsoring congregations to attend, as well as the guest speakers themselves and their families, everybody else was invited to join us online. We probably had 80 or so in person. The rest were connecting digitally. In the past, we've had between 200, 250 people at these, so I don't know what the online attendance was. I don't have access to those figures, but it was well attended by those um, who were able to be there from those two congregations, and so I'm thankful for the invitation to go up there and tackle a rather difficult subject. It was a sermon that I preached here just over a year ago. It was one of the last ones we did in person in early March of 2020, right before the pandemic arrived on us. And um, anyway, I asked for your help back then to help improve it, improve it, and you gave some good suggestions as to the PowerPoint and the uh, the handout and that kind of thing, and I really appreciate that. So it was well received, and I am thankful for, for that chance to be away. I made my way back on Sunday and into Monday, got to worship in La Crosse, Wisconsin on Sunday morning, right there on the Mississippi on the far west side of Wisconsin, and then traveled across from west to east over to Appleton and was able to be there for their 6 o'clock service on Sunday evening. I had never traveled the entire width of Wisconsin like that, and it was a good experience. I'm more accustomed to going north and south in this state, up I-39, I-90, or whatever it is, and a 51 and beyond. Uh, but anyway, it was a good experience to be able to do that. The picture on the top on your screen, if you're joining us online, is of the group in Minnesota. And I don't know if you can see this, but there are a number of uh, kids sitting on the front row. And this is a series of lectures on righteousness in remarriage. And so it was a difficult topic for the day with a number of uh, lectures dealing with that from the Bible, but it was so good to see some Beaver Creek Bible Camp kids sitting right there on the front row. I really appreciate that. So that was a good thing. And so the picture on top is of Minnesota on Saturday. The church in La Crosse is on the bottom left, and then the church in Appleton is there on the bottom right. But it was uh, very good to be able to visit those congregations on the way home. Tonight we return to our study of the book of Acts, which of course is a history of the early church uh, written to a man by the name of Theophilus by Luke, the beloved physician, as he is described later in Colossians by the Apostle Paul. Up to this point in the book, we have looked at the first three chapters, and so in the ABCs of Acts over on the right-hand side there, we summarize chapter 1 with the word ascension, Referring to the ascension of Jesus back into heaven, we also could have used apostle appointed as the apostles pick a replacement for Judas in Acts chapter 1. In chapter 2, we looked at the beginning of the church. So Peter preaches, 3,000 people are baptized and are then added by God to the church at that point. And so we have the beginning of the church or baptism would also be a good summary of chapter 2, uh, starting with the letter B. In Acts 3, we saw a man carried by his friends and left there at the temple gates as the custom was. He was healed by Peter and John. And so the summary of chapter 3 is carried and cured. And again, I'm so thankful to Sarah for that good improvement on that one, but carried and cured. And then after the healing with the man still clinging to him, 
Uh, Peter preaches to the people who have come together, and the sermon is very similar to the one that he just preached in Acts chapter 2. Preachers are known to repeat themselves. I don't know if you've noticed that, but uh, preachers tend to repeat themselves. I don't know if you've noticed that, but uh, here Peter does it again, and so he preaches in chapter 3, very close to what he preached in chapter 2, similar outline. He introduces Jesus, then basically says, you people killed him, and then he explains what to do about it. They need to repent and return. And then last week, we looked at the first half of Acts chapter 4. As the Sadducees have Peter and John arrested, they are thrown into jail for the night, and the next morning they're called in by the religious authorities. And these men want to know, by what power or in what name have you done this? And as we noted uh, last week, they couldn't even ask, by what power have you done this miracle? They couldn't even bear to put that into words and we found that a little bit interesting they were probably afraid they might legitimize it and so by what power have you done this they couldn't even describe it uh, peter though he takes that question and he uses it to introduce them to jesus the one whom you crucified the one who god raised from the dead this is the one who gave us this authority and with that they not only answer the question but they also throw a pretty good jab at the sadducees who don't believe in the resurrection and not only did these people crucify Jesus, but in doing so, they rejected him as the chief cornerstone, which is a direct fulfillment of prophecy from the old law. Uh, the council doesn't really have a good answer for that. There's no way to answer it. And so they threaten Peter and John. They resort to threats of violence. Peter throws it right back. Whether it is right in the sight of God to give heed to you, rather than to God, you be the judge. For we cannot stop speaking about what we have seen and heard. And so they are determined disciples. Uh, the leaders are pretty much afraid of the people. They know they can't get away with punishing Peter and John because the people are on their side after this amazing thing has happened. And so they just threaten them again and ultimately let them go. Well, tonight we hope to look at the second half of Acts chapter 4. So let's pick up tonight with Acts 4, verses 23 through 28. Acts 4, 23 through 28. And it looks like we're covering about half a chapter a week. As I said going into this, we are not in a hurry with the study of Acts. There's a lot of good material here. We're not rushing through this. We don't need to make it through the whole Bible again in the next 21 years, nothing like that. Uh, we're not shooting to break that record or anything, but uh, let's take our time going through this book and appreciate what God wants us to know from it. So Acts 4, 23 through 28. When they had been released, they went to their own companions and reported all that the chief priest and the elders had said to them. And when they heard this, they lifted their voices to God with one accord and said, O Lord, it is you who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and all that is in them, who by the Holy Spirit through the mouth of our father David, your servant, said, Why did the Gentiles rage and the peoples devise futile things? The kings of the earth took their stand, and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his Christ. For truly in this city there were gathered together against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the peoples of Israel, to do whatever your hand and your purpose predestined to occur. We'll notice at the beginning of this passage, as soon as Peter and John are released, that is, released from custody, having been threatened a couple times for preaching in Jesus' name, they go immediately to their companions. And I'm assuming uh, this is a reference to the church. It's either the apostles or the church, the, the Christian family group of some kind. They go to their Christian family, is the way I would take this, and they tell them, Everything that's happened, they bring them up to speed from the healing of the man who couldn't walk to their arrest, I'm sure, to being threatened and released. And as they explain the threats from the chief priests and the elders, and as soon as they hear that report, what's the first thing these people do? They pray, right? They go to God. They, at least it seems like a prayer. It's not called a prayer. It doesn't say that they went to God in prayer, but they lift their voices to God in one accord. And I suppose it could have been a song, but it really sounds like a prayer. And if it is, which it seems like it is, I believe that it is a prayer, this would be the first public prayer ever recorded, offered by the early church. And so they go to God in prayer together. And I'm just assuming they're not speaking this in unison, but how do we go to God in prayer together? One person leads it, right? So some person serves as a spokesman leading the group to God's throne 
on behalf of the entire congregation. And so it's not a personal prayer for me this or me that. Dear God, I thank you. I praise you. No, it's we. Uh, we come to you. This is us as a congregation. We are approaching you in prayer. And how do we make it our prayer instead of just some guy's prayer? Well, we say amen at the end of it. And I'll tell you, the church in Appleton was really, really good to that uh, about that. You could see that they had been taught well concerning the use of the word amen. A lot of amens in that congregation, and I really appreciate that. But anyway, this early church, this group that the apostles report to, they apparently go to God in prayer as a group with one voice. Uh, let's notice the parts of the prayer, the structure of it, so maybe we can learn something and uh, use it as something of a pattern. Uh, notice it starts with a statement of praise, doesn't it? And isn't this how Jesus started the model prayer, the sample prayer, as we sometimes call it, in Matthew 6, commonly referred to as the Lord's Prayer? Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, or holy, or set apart be your name. So just as Jesus started with praise in that sample or that model prayer, so also these new Christians were apparently listening to that, or they'd been taught well by the apostles, and so they also started with praise. O Lord, it is you who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and all that is in them. And so they are praising God for his creation. And we might wonder, what does the creation have to do with this situation that they're in right here. It has everything to do with it. The God who created everything we see around us is able to help us right now. And I think this reminds us God really did make the heaven and the earth and the sea and all that is in them. This world did not create itself. And life on this earth most certainly did not spontaneously erupt from non-living matter. That does not happen. It has never happened. It never will happen in the future, and all of life certainly did not evolve to the way we are today from uh, much simpler life forms. If the latest and most popular theories on the origin of life and everything we see around us are true, this prayer makes no sense whatsoever, does it? It's really, it, it makes no sense. As it is, though, God really did make the heaven and the earth and the sea and all that is in them. This is why we can go to God in prayer. He is our creator. And so as they prepare to ask for something, they're coming to that in just a moment, but as they get to that point, notice they start by praising God for who he is. He is the creator of everything. And if we look at the text, we find in most translations that it's in all caps. And I know we've discussed this over and over again, but if you're joining us for the first time tonight, um, this is how many of the translations normally refer to uh, quotations from the Old Testament in all caps in the New Testament. So the reference to God making the heaven and the earth and the sea and all that is in them is a quote from the Old Testament. And most of us probably have a cross-reference to Exodus and also to Nehemiah and also to one of the Psalms. In other words, the creation is critical to understanding not only Acts 4, but it's also critical to understanding other parts of the Bible as well. And if you go back to the quote as it is originally found in Exodus, you may remember that God cites the creation as the reason for the fourth commandment about honoring the Sabbath day and keeping it holy. And so because I made the earth and everything in it in, in six days, this is why you are to honor the Sabbath day. And so that particular commandment hinges on the Jewish people's understanding of the creation in six literal days. Uh, in Nehemiah, the priests and the Levites use this reference as they lead the people in worship when they return to Jerusalem after the captivity. And so they base their worship on the creation. And then in Psalms, God creating everything we see around us is a basis for praise. And so it's important to remember that God did, in fact, create the heaven and the earth and the sea and all that is in them. The first 11 chapters of Genesis are not myth. Uh, they are not just some... Of poetic creation, but they are actual literal history as recorded in those chapters. Well, then they basically pray scripture back to God in this paragraph, don't they? Not only do they praise him by referring to the creation, but they are now telling God what obviously he already knows. 
And we may feel a little bit weird about that. That's kind of strange. Of course he knows these things. They're, they're quoting scripture back to God in a prayer. But again, that's all right, because God already knows everything, doesn't he? Not only does he already know what's in this passage that they quote back to him, but he knows everything. He knows everything about us, things that we've never told anybody. And so if we wanted to tell something, uh, tell God something that he didn't already know, we'd have a pretty hard time doing that, wouldn't we? I remember a few years ago hearing Brother John DeBerry down at uh, Polishing the Pulpit, and he said, has it ever occurred to you that nothing has ever occurred to God? And I appreciate that. I'm thankful for that statement. Uh, that was something that just occurred to me when he said that, that uh, nothing has just occurred to God. He's always known everything. And so they pray scripture back to God, and they introduce this with just a brief passing reference to the inspiration process, explaining that the Holy Spirit was speaking through the mouth of King David. And by checking the references on this with the little footnotes, if you have those, the cross-references, we find uh, that this one is a direct quote from Psalm number 2, verses 1 and 2. In context, as a whole, Psalm 2 is a psalm about Jesus. And it's quoted a number of times in the New Testament, including at least a time or two in the book of Hebrews. Uh, interestingly, in the book of Psalms itself, we are not told that David is the author. Some of you may remember that we've studied all of the Psalms over the past few years, and you may remember that some are listed as being by David, those ancient um, little headings on those Psalms, a Psalm of David on the occasion of him hiding in the cave or something like that. A Psalm 2 does not have an ancient heading like that. It doesn't say a Psalm of King David. Uh, so some are by David, others are by other men like Moses or Solomon or Korah. Some are anonymous. Well, Psalm 2 is anonymous. We don't know the author of Psalm 2 when we're reading Psalm 2. But here we find that this anonymous psalm is actually by King David. And so we can add that to the David column, can't we? Uh, by inspiration in the New Testament, Psalm 2 is identified as having been written by King David, even though it's not said uh, back in the actual Psalm number 2. And the point of Psalm 2 is that even though ungodly world leaders might oppose God and his plan, God will ultimately come out on top. And isn't that exactly what these people need to know right now? Jesus has been killed. Peter and John have now been severely threatened by the same men who just killed Jesus. And now they're basically... In this prayer, the early Christians are reminding God of what he has said about all this. Remember, Lord, that this has been prophesied. And remember, God, that you have promised to help us or to bring us through this situation. And so they are quoting scripture back to God. In a so what moment in this passage, I would uh, take this as a reminder. If we're ever stuck in our prayer life, have you ever been stuck in your prayer life, not really knowing what to pray? I've been stuck in my prayer life. Well, dear God, you know, I don't know. This is the way it's going. Beyond that, I'm not, I'm kind of a little like writer's block almost, where we don't really know. If we're ever stuck in our prayer life, I would suggest we can often get inspiration by going to the Psalms and reading through some of those Psalms or maybe to other passages. And then by using some of those scriptures as something of a guide for our prayers. You know, it's kind of hard to go wrong by meditating on the Word of God and by praying it back to God. It's hard to make a mistake, isn't it, by quoting the Word of God. And so that's a reminder for us in terms of a practical application of this passage in the first recorded public prayer offered by the Lord's people in the book of Acts. About half of it, it seems, is a direct quote from the Old Testament, from Exodus, from Nehemiah, and from the Psalms. Well, starting in verse 27, they give God a bit of a history lesson as they publicly recognize that Psalm number two applies to what they're going through. So they're basically saying, dear Lord, you knew all along that this would happen. This is all a part of your providential plan. And so we recognize that these things happening are a result of your will being done. Well, this leads us to their request. The please help us part of this prayer. And so we continue then with Acts 4, verses 29 through 31. Acts 4, 29 through 31. And now, Lord, 
take note of their threats, and grant that your bondservants may speak your word with all confidence, while you extend your hand to heal, and signs and wonders take place through the name of your holy servant Jesus. And when they had prayed, the place where they had gathered together was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak the word of God with boldness. And so in response to everything that's happening here, do they pray for safety? Do they pray that God would spare their lives? Dear God, please change the minds of the Sanhedrin so that they stop being so mean. Is that the prayer that they pray? Do they pray for the persecution to stop? No, they do not. But notice instead they ask God to notice what they are going through. God, please look at us. We want you to know what, what is happening here. And then they ask that they might be able as a result of this, to come out on the other side, speaking the word of God with all confidence. As the signs and wonders continue, they ask for courage to keep on speaking and preaching the word of God. And remember, this is the exact thing that the council had just commanded Peter and John not to do. Remember earlier in this chapter, do not go on speaking the things about Jesus. And again, here they are praying about it. And their prayer is not, please keep us safe. But their prayer is, please, dear Lord, remember, see what we're going through and give us the courage to speak your word with boldness and confidence and courage. Before we get to the rest of this paragraph, I wanted to share an interesting paragraph from J.W. McGarvey. J.W. McGarvey is a gospel preacher from the mid to late 1800s and into the early 1900s here in the United States. Our brother McGarvey actually has two commentaries on Acts, which I find interesting, and what is known as his original commentary on Acts, now it's known as the original, published in 1863. So keep that date in mind, 1863, this guy was writing a commentary on Acts. And then there is his new commentary on Acts, first published back in 1892 in Lexington, Kentucky. And I've been using both of these as resources for this study of Acts, along with a number of other commentaries and written material. And here's an interesting paragraph from the original commentary that was repeated in the new commentary. So again, preachers repeat themselves, uh, even when they write. So it's in the first, it's also in the second. And then after I read this paragraph, I want to share the footnote that comes after it. By the way, I couldn't help but notice that uh, J.W. McGarvey has an awesome beard, doesn't he? He is my bearded brother. This is a glorious beard on this man. Um, but as I read this paragraph, let's ask ourselves whether this could have been written today. Listen to how up-to-date this is. This is what Brother McGarvey says about this passage in Acts, the passage we're looking at right now. And remember, this was first published in 1863. This is what Brother McGarvey says. In these days of passion and war... When it is common for prayers to be filled with entreaties for victory over our enemies, and sometimes with maledictions upon those who are waging war against our supposed rights, it is quite refreshing to observe the tone of this apostolic prayer. These men were not in danger of losing some merely political power or privilege, but the dearest and most indisputable right they had on earth was denied them, and they were threatened with death if they did not relinquish it. Yet in their prayer they manifest no vindictive or resentful spirit, but they pray in reference to their enemies only this, Lord, behold their threatenings, while they leave the Lord without suggestion or request to do as might appear good in his sight. By such prayers as are often uttered at the present time, men seek to make God a partisan in all their angry contentions as though he were nothing more than themselves. Isn't that interesting? As we're tempted to complain about our rights being taken away, right? We see the news, we read online, we get caught up in social media and our rights or this and that, right? It's very easy to turn prayer into some kind of partisan activity where we ask God to take our side on this issue. Dear God, this is the way I think about this. You need to think like I do. But I would just point out that is not what the Christians do in Acts chapter 4. But instead, they ask God 
to behold their threatenings. Dear God, notice, please, what's going on here. And then they ask for courage. Not for a change in circumstances. They don't ask for whatever it is to change or be taken away, but they ask for courage so that they can preach on with boldness. Anyway, with this in mind, and to put it in context, to give us a little more uh, flavor for the times in which this paragraph I just read was first written, I want to read Brother McGarvey's footnote on this in his new commentary on Acts, the one that was published a number of years later. And there's a little asterisk and then the note down below concerning this paragraph. This is what he says to explain what I just read. These thoughts were first written amid the din and confusion of our great civil war, when even devout men on both sides were beside themselves with the passions of the time. The composition of the first edition of this commentary was once interrupted by the booming of cannon, cannon in the siege of Lexington, Missouri, not many miles from the author's home in 1862, and once by the march and countermarch of contending armies through Lexington, Kentucky, where he lived in 1863. And that's amazing to me. And, and I had a hard time with this. I thought in, in the actual commentary, I did change two things. They had uh, abbreviations for the state. They had Lexington M-O and Lexington K-Y. And I thought, wait a minute, I associate this guy with Lexington, Kentucky. What in the world is this reference to Lexington M.O.? And I'm like, I think that's Missouri. I mean, I know that's the postal code today, but remember, this is back in 1893 or whatever when the second commentary was published. So I looked it up, and sure enough, there was a siege on Lexington, Missouri, and I noticed also that Brother McGarvey lived in Missouri for a while. From what I can tell, that siege of Lexington, Missouri actually happened in 1861, so I think he got the date off in his commentary by one year. But most of us can hardly even imagine what he describes here. Um, I have never had my study of God's word interrupted by cannon fire. Have you? I've never been in my office or in my chair by the wood stove and, and heard cannon fire in the distance and been worried for my safety, at least in that way. And yet, as he was writing this paragraph, there were cannons going off in the distance. And yet, as Brother McGarvey wrote these comments on Acts 4, this is what he was facing. And I just wanted to share this because I know we think we live in somewhat contentious times, and we do, and there's a lot on the line today. But let's keep all of this in perspective. If we ever find ourselves directly threatened by the government for preaching the gospel, let's keep this in mind and let's pray, not necessarily for changed circumstances, but let's pray for courage and for boldness. And I think we can get that out of Brother McGarvey's comments on this passage. But back to this paragraph in Acts 4, 29 through 31, where we are. In the second half of this passage, we have God's response. Notice Dr. Luke says, The place where they are gathered is shaken, and they are filled with the Holy Spirit, and they begin to speak the word of God with boldness. And so their prayer is immediately answered in a positive way. And again, God doesn't strike the Sanhedrin dead. That would have kind of solved this problem, right? They could have gone on preaching and teaching if God had just zapped the Sanhedrin. That wasn't their prayer. He doesn't remove the threats, but he empowers them to keep on preaching the gospel of Jesus with courage and with boldness. Before we move on to the last paragraph in this chapter, I also want to share at least a part of a post that came in earlier this morning from a friend from the Minneapolis area who was on his way home from Cozumel, Mexico, okay? And he posted this morning that the air distance is 17, 17 miles, 1,717. Uh, but on foot, I think he probably put it in Google Maps or something. I don't recognize that map. I don't know if that's Google or something else. But he calculated if he walked it from Cozumel to Minneapolis, it would be a journey of 2,922 miles. Remember, he's flying home today. So as he started thinking about that, he was thinking this morning at the airport in Cozumel, about how different everything was for Paul on his missionary journeys in the book of Acts. What he wouldn't have given for a flight from Antioch to Ephesus or Jerusalem to Rome, he says. And I thought that was interesting, pointing that out. But this is what he goes on to say. We will, Lord willing, board a plane tomorrow and in approximately five hours arrive in Minnesota, barely missing a single meal. 
The struggles that the apostles endured for the sake of the kingdom, the harsh travel conditions, and every sort of danger from weather conditions that caused shipwreck to those who were lying in wait on deserted stretches of roads. The luxury that we experience compared to what they had back then should never be taken for granted. He says, I did a little calculating. The average person walks three to four miles an hour. So I went with four because Paul was zealous to get there. And I based walking 12 hours per day. So 29.22 divided by 4 equals 730.5 divided by 12 equals 60.875. So his conclusion is it would have taken the Apostle Paul 60.875 days to walk from Cozumel to Minneapolis, walking and barring any unforeseen delays like being arrested or beaten and stoned and left for dead, etc., etc., our lives are filled with so many wonderful conveniences that we often don't really appreciate. He goes on to say we should continually be thankful to the Christians from the past for their wonderful examples of endurance and dedication to their service in the kingdom. It is hard for our generation to comprehend the difficulties they faced in everyday life, yet boldly ventured out to win more souls to Christ. And then he closes with a quote from 1 Thessalonians 5, 16-18. Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, in everything give thanks, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. And so as we move forward, as we look at these examples of persecution starting here in Acts chapters 3 and 4, I thought we might appreciate that little bit of perspective tonight. Yes, we do face some challenging conditions for preaching the gospel these days, but we are incredibly blessed as well. And tonight we've learned that when we are commanded not to preach, if we're commanded not to teach in the name of Jesus, the early Christians prayed not for easier lives, not for the persecution to stop. But in this passage, they pray for courage. And God answers that prayer in a powerful way. So let's continue tonight by looking at the last paragraph. This is Acts 4, verses 32 through 37. Acts 4, 32 through 37. And the congregation of those who believed were of one heart and soul, and not one of them claimed that anything belonging to him was his own, but all things were common property to them. And with great power, the apostles were giving testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and abundant grace was upon them all. For there was not a needy person among them, for all who were owners of land or houses would sell them and bring the proceeds of the sales and lay them at the apostles' feet and they would be distributed to each as any had need. Now Joseph, a Levite of Cyprian birth, who was also called Barnabas by the apostles, which translated means son of encouragement, and who owned a tract of land, sold it, and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. In verse 32 then, we have another reference to the early Christians sharing with one another. And once again, I have to point out that this was not communism, as some have suggested. That was real big, especially 40, 50 years ago, to say, hey, the early Christians were communists. communists. They shared everything. But remember, this is not the government coming in. This is not the government forcing some kind of equality of outcome, taking from the rich, giving to the poor, making it all even across the board. That's not what's going on here. This is a voluntary sharing, and this is the way it should be in God's family. We're not talking about a political system here. We're talking about how we behave toward one another in the Lord's body. We share with each other. And I am so thankful that I personally have seen this over and over and over again through the years. God's people helping God's people. Helping with food, helping with housing, helping with clothing. And just the necessities of life. If there's a need, I have seen God's people come through in some amazing ways. And I've probably said this again just a few weeks ago and we studied the last few verses of Acts 2, but I'll repeat it again tonight. If I had $100 personally to set aside to help others in some way, I would much rather give it through the church than to send it through Washington, D.C. for the politicians to sort out and redistribute. As we know, they will take their cut there's then waste, there's abuse, there's fraud, there's mismanagement and overhead and so on and so on. And by the way, by the time it makes its way all the way back to Wisconsin, that $100 will do a fraction of the good that it would have done in the form of taxes. I would much rather have Jesus get the credit for it and then have it distributed by the congregation. That's as opposed to me voting to raise somebody else's taxes to have their money 
taken away by force and redistributed to others. The more effective method would be for me to take that $100 and give it directly to somebody or through the Lord's church. Now, obviously, there is a place for paying taxes. We are thankful for our citizenship. We're going to see Paul thankful for his citizenship later in this book. And yet, when it comes to taking care of the poor, uh, the church does a much better job than the government ever will. And I think many of us who've been deeply involved in the work of the church have seen this firsthand in a way that many people just haven't seen. Um, I'll give a few examples. I think of Hurricane Katrina. Churches of Christ, disaster relief. We're in there with exactly what was needed several days before FEMA ever got there. And as I remember it, as Katrina was coming in, our brothers and sisters in Nashville, I've been to their loading dock and their sorting facility a number of years ago with the church in Goodlesville took us on a tour. But as Hurricane Katrina was coming in, these guys down there, men and women, Christian brothers and sisters, were loading trucks and they had Christian semi-truck drivers on call, sitting there, probably with those trucks idling, waiting to, to hit the go button. And they got out of there, and they got down there to the Goodwood Boulevard congregation in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, right on the edge of the total disaster. And they were there ready to get it done. And they got it done in some amazing ways, just convoys of semis going down there with bleach and buckets and mops and exactly what was needed. As I remember it, in the days right after that, our congregation uh, sent close to $10,000 down there to, to help build a shower house behind the church building there in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. And we got notice that they were hosting around 150 people in their church building, people who had just fled from right down there where the levees had been overwhelmed and all that, and, and these people were living in a church building. Can you imagine 100 people living in our church building? You'd have some needs, right? Food immediately. And then very quickly, you'd start needing showers, wouldn't you? Especially down in Louisiana. And so this church built a shower house, temporary shower house, back behind their church building. And our funds from the Four Lakes congregation helped do that. So here we knew somebody at that congregation. We got them the funds immediately. And these people who had lost everything could at least get showers almost right away. So I'm saying there is a direct, there's no overhead. That money went directly to that church that built this building and got it done in a way that they could get clean and do some laundry and so on. The same thing happened uh, with the big tsunami that hit India a number of years ago. Some of our Christian brothers over there, you may remember if you were here at the time, they lost their fishing boats. And the local Hindu population was really making it tough on them, making it hard to get boats at decent prices. They, were, they knew they were Christians, so there was some persecution going on. And once again, as a congregation, we knew personally of that because of somebody we know in that area. And as a church, again, we sent them around $10,000 to help replace those fishing boats. So Christians helping Christians, not just a handout, but we got these men, these fishermen back on their feet in a way that they could then go on and take care of their families and support the widows and the orphans over there without more direct help being needed. I hope that makes sense. But as a church, we were able to send those funds directly. Nothing was lost through fraud or abuse. It just went directly from us to them in the name of Jesus as it should be, and some good help was done. This is also why we personally don't donate in our family to man-made religious groups. Uh, the bell ringers, right, out in front of Walmart or whatever, we don't do that. It's not because of the people that they help. It's because they will often use those donations in their efforts to promote a mistaken view of Christianity. And again, groups like the Salvation Army, uh, which is a church. A lot of people don't know that. Uh, years ago, I remember studying with a woman who had been a part of the Salvation Army for years. And when we were going through and studying these things, we got the baptism. This woman started weeping, just openly sobbing, sitting there on her couch. And and she said, of all the years I've been there, these people never even mentioned baptism. I've never heard about this before. And I need to be baptized right away. And so we baptized this woman. Um, but they first brought her in with some benevolent help provided to them through the bell ringing. And it's not that the woman was not deserving of the help. That's not it at all. It's not that those groups aren't doing some good physically to people. But let's go back again. If I have that $100 set aside to help others, I would much rather do it through the Lord's church instead of through either the government or a man-made religious institution. 
And so I'm just explaining why we don't do the kettle thing in our family. I hope that makes sense to you. Uh, we want our money to be used in an appropriate way, in a way where the Lord gets the credit. Um, in verse 33, we see the prayer from the previous paragraph continue to be answered in a powerful way. The apostles continue preaching the resurrection of Jesus with power. So they had prayed for courage, and now uh, Luke says that they are preaching with boldness. In verses 34 and 35, we get back to these people helping each other. Uh, Christians were selling land and selling houses and bringing the proceeds of those sales to the apostles' feet to be distributed to each as any had need. Um, one of the best parts of serving as an elder have, has been those times when people have come to us as an eldership and they've said, God has been good to us this year. Here is several hundred dollars. Please use it to help somebody who needs it. That is so encouraging. And it happens behind the scenes. It happens more often than you might think. We don't put out a call for help. We don't announce it when it happens, but it does happen from time to time. And often the elders might be aware of some need that others are not. And so the funds are distributed with no waste. It's Christians helping Christians. And that's what happens here in Acts chapter 4. Uh, at the end here, we have a reference to Barnabas. For most of us, it's probably probably been quite a while since we've studied Barnabas. I'm thinking like at least, at least three days or something. Uh, I am so thankful for Josh's lesson on Barnabas this past Lord's Day. Uh, I must confess, as I was worshiping in La Crosse on Sunday, I was listening to the sermon there in La Crosse with my ears, but I had the Four Lakes YouTube channel open on my phone in my lap, and I was kind of reading Josh's subtitles with my eyes and um, listening to the speaker. So I, I got like two sermons at once on Sunday. I, I was hoping I would get like extra credit or something uh, by participating in two services at once. I'm not sure how that works. Uh, but I then got to listen to the lesson on my drive from La Crosse over to Appleton Sunday afternoon. Uh, by the way, we did get some feedback from a Christian woman outside Wisconsin who said that Josh's lesson was one of the best that she's heard in at least a year. And so I thought I'd pass along that, uh, that encouragement, the encouragement uh, publicly tonight uh, uh, so that Josh gets it there. But anyway, I'm, I'm trying to be encouraging, I guess, like Barnabas was, and I passed that along. So I took that as good news. Uh, anyway, his name is Joseph. But he was known by a nickname, Barnabas, which means son of encouragement. He was an encourager. Uh, but here we have just a brief passing reference to Barnabas, owning a piece of land and selling it, and then bringing the money from that sale and laying it at the apostles' feet. And that's all we're told right here. But it leads to what comes next in chapter 5, because it seems as if a Christian couple notices what Barnabas does, and then they are perhaps motivated to follow his example and they get in trouble in the process. But let's save that for our study next week. So next week then, let's pick up with Acts chapter 5. And remember, please be thinking of any words starting with the letter E uh, to summarize what happens in chapter 5. Also, if you haven't done so already, even if you have, uh, try to either read through or listen to the entire book of Acts all at once, if at all possible. I think it'll help us understand what's going on in the whole book and give us a deeper appreciation of it. Uh, thank you so much for taking the time to study together tonight. I hope to see you this Sunday for worship, either at 9 or at 1030. This would be a great time to sign up if you haven't done so already. Let me know if I can help. Let me know if you have something that we need to be praying about. I hope to work on the bulletin on Saturday. So as soon as you know of anything that needs to be updated in the bulletin or anything I can pray for personally, anything that we as elders need to know about, please reach out and get in touch. Uh, let's close tonight by going to God in prayer. Our Father in heaven, you are the God who created this world and everything that we see around us. You are the great and awesome God. When we get discouraged by what we see going on in the world around us, we pray that you would bless us with courage so that we can communicate your word with boldness. We pray that we would also be aware of needs in our Christian family. We pray that we would open our eyes to the struggles of our own brothers and sisters in this congregation. And we pray that we would open our hearts to help in practical, concrete ways. Be with the elders of the church here. We pray that you would bless us with wisdom and with courage in all things, that we would always do what is right without hesitation. Thank you, Father, for hearing our prayer. We come to you tonight in the name of Jesus, our Savior. Amen.